Thank you, thank you. Um, uh, before I begin, good afternoon. Welcome to the post-lunch haze. Um, I want to start out by thanking Dr. Helen Caldicott and Physicians for Social Responsibility for this symposium. It's amazing, and I want the public to know that you are getting information here that would not be readily available to us otherwise, and it's very important information. So thank, thank them from the bottom of my heart. So just how contaminated is our food? I got this question a lot, a lot of times after Fukushima exploded, and I'm still getting it, and it's frustrating because it doesn't have a good answer. We know that radiation from Fukushima did reach the U.S. directly. Iodine-131, uh, cesium-137 and 134 are evidence of this. Other radioisotopes could have reached us as well, but they're harder to detect. This doesn't make them less important, but my talk will focus on cesium for a number of reasons which will become clear. So what needs to be assessed from this point forward is how cesium cycles and becomes concentrated or biomagnified in the environment over the long term, and where it might enter our food supply as a result. Now, remember, our food can come not just from what is grown in the U.S., but what is harvested from the Pacific Ocean and imported from other countries, including Japan. So what are the most important points for understanding radiation in this food monitoring context? Radiation is expelled from the nucleus of an atom and is represented by a unit called a becquerel. One becquerel is equal to one atomic disintegration per second, and different radionuclides give off different kinds of radiation. <clears throat> different types of radiation are blocked by different substances depending on the density of the substance and the quality of the radiation itself. And certain types of radiation that would be less damaging outside our bodies can become much more damaging if taken internally, inhaled or ingested, since there's nothing inside our cells like a piece of paper or plexiglass to block this radioactive energy. In this case, each one of these disintegrations or hits, represented by a becquerel, may cause damage and disease. Also, because some radiation is more easily blocked, like alpha and beta particle radiation, it can be challenging to measure certain radionuclides inside food if this is the only type of radiation that they emit. In general, gamma radiation is easier to measure because it travels through most material more easily, like the flesh of an apple or the flesh of a fish. This makes gamma the obvious choice for testing because you don't need to do anything extra to the food to prepare it, like cut an apple or pulp the apple. The radionuclide cesium-137 emits a gamma ray, so it is the radionuclide most often measured. But even if you don't find that cesium gamma, it doesn't mean the food doesn't contain other radionuclides that are of concern, like strontium-90, plutonium-239. So obviously measuring food for just gamma has serious limitations, but it would be a reasonable start in any food testing program. <clears throat> Fukushima isn't the only source of cesium contamination. We have been being exposed to man-made radiation for generations from a number of different sources. So atomic bomb blasts worldwide, 954 petabecquerels, I will use quadrillion. And to give you an illustration of what a quadrillion is, if you have a quadrillion pennies on top of each other, they would reach the sun and back five times over. This is a big number. <clears throat> Every nuclear power reactor releases radionuclides to water and air as part of their operating plan. It doesn't take an accident to release this material, although we know they've had plenty of those as well. The total release amount for cesium-134 and 137 is currently unavailable and would have to be calculated for the U.S. nuclear power reactor fleet. It would also be based on questionable affluent release data that is most often collected by industry, not independent parties. Then there's Chernobyl. 85 quadrillion becquerels of cesium-137. This number has a margin of plus or minus 26 petabecquerels. So that's 26 quadrillion becquerels. Fukushima releases to air and ocean. Release of Nobel gas, unspecified as to what type it was. These numbers are from a TEPCO press release that came out earlier on. And finally, 
10 million becquerels of cesium-134 and 137 are still, as far as I know, being released every hour. Now, what these slides have shown us is that we don't have a good idea of just how much cesium has been released or continues to be released. Who's testing? So who's testing our food for man-made radioactivity? Vital Choice and Eden are private companies who pay to have their products tested. Berkeley Nuclear Department ran about 115 total samples. I think all of them were from California. Most were from 2011. FDA, EPA, and DOE have severely curtailed their monitoring since the initial days of the accident. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration was thought to be watching something called the Kuroshio Current, which somebody mentioned yesterday in a presentation. And if the contamination reached this current, they will consider monitoring California coast seawater and sediment. But I don't think they're doing that yet, and I believe the contamination has reached this current, which is like a fast track to the California Pacific coast. <laughs> These aren't the only universities and institutes that have done testing, but the testing has been limited. It needs more money to continue, and there has been uh, complain, complaining about lack of funding for this very important work. Current and past food testing programs have a number of shortcomings. Most samples are only tested for gamma-emitting radionuclides. Testing has been severely curtailed now, even though Fukushima is still spewing and the contamination is becoming entrenched. EPA was criticized by the Inspector General because 20% of its radiation monitors in the U.S. were out of service when Fukushima when the Fukushima catastrophe began. And a very important point, and I want everyone to hear this, sampling a piece of food every once in a while gives you no real idea of the scope of the contamination or the bioaccumulation and doesn't pinpoint any radiation hotspots that might exist. So in general, testing of U.S. foodstuffs is inadequate. The U.S. limit of 1,200 becquerels per kilogram of just cesium-134 and or 137 is way too high. And it isn't binding, because the FDA can decide to act or not at any level of cesium contamination. So it's exactly like not having a standard at all. Japan, on the other hand, their limit is 100 becquerels per kilogram. Finally, release of info to the public is paltry, if at all. So what have they found so far? <clears throat> California kelp, iodine levels were significantly higher than before Fukushima. They didn't test it for cesium, and they should. They've asked for funding. I don't know if they've got it. I don't know an update on this, but this is important because kelp provides a food source for fish. So there is concern that contamination from the fish that eat the kelp will be concentrated within the fish. Pistachios grown in California were shipped to a Japanese supermarket. The Japanese supermarket tested 18 becquerels per kilogram of cesium-134 and 137. Beef raised in Japan was tested and approved for market sale and then recalled, but not before it was fed to Japanese school children. All of this beef could have been sold to the U.S., and the FDA may not have pulled it. California grass. 14 becquerels per kilogram, cesium-134 and 137. Grass, like kelp, is the beginning of a potential biomagnification chain which could concentrate cesium in cattle, for instance. And as Berkeley put it on their monitoring site, for understanding the time dependence of food chain results, the grass and soil is what to look at. Green tea, 162 kilograms of it, shipped to France from Japan and rejected because of this level of contamination, 1,038. The U.S. recommendations would have accepted this. Bluefin tuna swam all the way across the Pacific and reached the California coast, retaining cesium-134 and 137. Canada's cesium limit is apparently 1,000 becquerels per kilogram of cesium. And news reports express concern that they will import very contaminated fish from Japan. It is a concern that the U.S. should also share. They were also concerned because contamination was higher in 2012 than it had been in 2011. And this fits with cesium's tendency to biomagnify, but we will have to stay tuned and we should keep measuring ocean fish from the Pacific for cesium. 
Because of the tendency to biomagnify, in general, we need more testing. And we need to think about how to test over a longer time frame, not just a few years. So how should we think about these contamination levels, and how low should we attempt to make cesium contamination in our food? Remember two things. There's no safe level of radiation. Every exposure does carry some risk, no matter how small. And two, cesium-134 and 137 did not exist in nature before we created and released them. This graph is from ICRP report 111. ICRP stands for uh, International Commission on Radiological Protection. They recommend how much exposure is okay for humans. Governments follow these recommendations when setting standards. This graph shows us even what are considered very small amounts of cesium when ingested routinely can build up to unexpected levels in the body. <clears throat> so it specifically shows that after about three years, ingesting 10 becquerels per day of cesium-137 can cause a buildup to over 1,400 becquerels total cesium-137 in your body. For a child who weighs about 30 kilograms, or about 66 pounds, this would be about 50 becquerels per kilogram of cesium-137 in them. And this number is important because in studies of post Chernobyl Belarus, cardiac abnormalities, heart problems, developed in children, who, children whose bodies contain 10 to 30 becquerels per kilogram of cesium. Irreversible myocardiopathologies develop at 50 becquerels per kilogram. Additional pathologies at these low levels can include hormone imbalances, angina, diabetes, and hypertension, which, by the way, are all sort of aging diseases as well. In addition to these diseases, as cesium passes out of your body, its radioactivity starts to damage your kidneys and your bladder, which in turn damages your body's ability to rid itself of the cesium. This could mean that your body could collect cesium more quickly than this graph currently shows, which means the total amount of cesium in your body would be higher over time than this graph shows from chronic ingestion. Why is the U.S. guideline so high? And how about Canada's? Well, it seems to be some sort of official policy to encourage people to accept increasingly radioactive food. Consider this quote also from ICRP Report 111. There may be situations where a sustainable agricultural economy is not possible without placing contaminated food on the market. As such, foods will be subject to market forces. This will necessitate an effective communication strategy to overcome the negative reactions from consumers outside the contaminated areas. So their plan consists not of informing the public that these contamination levels, what the contamination levels are so that we can decide for ourselves what is and is not appropriate. It consists instead of convincing us that man-made radiation in small doses is not harmful. So what are we going to do about this? Well, <clears throat> Beyond Nuclear in coalition with other groups that are part of the Fukushima Fallout Awareness Network, or FAN, are in the process of petitioning the Food and Drug Administration of the United States for a binding contamination, contamination limit of five. Five becquerels per kilogram of cesium-134 and 137. And we're also asking for testing of soils and other things. We are asking that the testing be widespread and that the data collected be recorded in a publicly available database, no matter what the cesium contamination level. A database of this information, if constructed properly, could inform research on cesium mobility, biomagnification in the environment, so it could have a broad usefulness, not just for consumers, but for research as well. If you want an easy-to-understand resource on this whole issue, Silence Deafening, Fukushima Fallout and Mother's Response by Kimberly Roberson speaks to the urgent need for food monitoring as radiation from nuclear power is now migrating to our homes and kitchens. And, of course, I'm with Beyond Nuclear. Uh, we have a newsletter. We're going to be having a public petition so that people can sign on this issue. We haven't got it up and running yet. But stick with our website, uh, info at beyondnuclear.org, and you can request our weekly newsletter. So, concluding remarks. When I first started to collect 
information that would help me recommend a level for cesium contamination in food, and five becquerels per kilogram was being bandied about. I wondered if this limit and the testing, that testing most of our food supply was somehow unreasonable. Through my research, I concluded no for several reasons. Cesium concentrates or biomagnifies in the environment through natural processes, so diluting it won't save us, ultimately. We have to track it and its movements. Historic and continuing cesium releases ensure that generations of humans have now been exposed to it. To what end? What is the damage that has already been done that we may not be able to see? And I'm thinking of multi-generational damage here. Belarus studies show damage at very low levels in children, and ICRP admits that even small amounts of cesium can bioaccumulate in our bodies to this level. There's a lack of publicly available info on cesium levels in food, and we have no reliable estimate on how much has been or is being released. And then finally, they are attempting to convince us everything is fine, despite all that we and they still don't know and all of the uncertainties. And what we do know and what we've seen here in this conference is very, very worrisome. So it isn't just a question anymore of which catastrophe or routine release is to blame for what cesium contamination or any contamination. It's a question of the totality of the radioactive contamination and the damage occurring from it across generations. And cesium is only one of very many radioactive isotopes released. So looking at this evidence, I am now thinking that five becquerels per kilogram might still ultimately be too high, but it is a good start to get a handle on what is contaminated, what isn't, and how we move forward. Thank you.